will the nation of Israel become the center of end time Bible prophecy? Yes or no? That's our topic on His Voice today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. All eyes on Israel. That's our subject. And this is actually the beginning of a four-part series uh, dealing with Israel issues, very controversial issues. Uh, and let me just start out with a, a Jewish joke. What do you get when you cross two Jews? The answer is three opinions. Uh, I can tell that joke because I'm Jewish. Uh, Steve Wahlberg, that's my last name, Wahlberg, grew up in a Jewish home in Los Angeles, uh, and I have wrestled with Israel issues, especially since I became a Christian and began studying Bible prophecy. Uh, it's no secret that Christians around the world, their eyes are on Israel, their eyes are on the Jewish state. They uh, strongly believe that Bible prophecy was fulfilled in 1948, that uh, Israel is now back in the land, that there will be a temple there uh, rebuilt on the Temple Mount, and that the Battle of Armageddon will be a final bloody military war against Jews during the seven years of tribulation. Uh, these are uh, dominant teachings in the Christian world. Uh, I looked with interest a number of years ago when an issue of Newsweek came out. Uh, I've got it in front of me, Newsweek, November 1, 1999. The front cover set was on prophecy. It said, Prophecy. What the Bible says about the end of the world was the subtitle. And on page 73 of that particular issue, uh, I quote it. It said that the predominant emphasis in Christian prophecy is on the return of the Jews to the Holy Land and the rebuilding of the Jerusalem Temple. Now, even though that quote is over 10 years old, uh, it's definitely true today when it comes to the predominant emphasis in Bible prophecy. If you go on Amazon.com and do a search, you'll find lots of books uh, such as uh, John Hagee's book, Jerusalem Countdown, A Warning to the World, Here's another book by Dave Hunt, The Final Battle for Jerusalem, Israel, Islam, and Armageddon. Here's another one, uh, The Latest Developments in Bible Prophecy by Randall Price. The book is called The Coming Last Days Temple. And the list goes on and on. There are television programs, movies, uh, novels, books, websites, radio shows that are uh, zeroed in on the Middle East. They're looking at events over there, they're, they, and they've got their eyes on the Bible, they're looking at Revelation, they're looking at Ezekiel, they're looking at uh, Zechariah, and they're looking at the newspapers, they're looking at what's happening in Israel with Iran and, and the uh, nuclear threat, and they are firmly convinced that end-time Bible prophecy will swirl around the Jewish nation. And what we're going to do in this series, uh, part one, all eyes on Israel, and then part two, part three, and part four, is we are going to uh, take a, a close look at these Israel issues. Uh, I know that, again, this is very controversial. Uh, I'm well aware of this. Uh, I've been wrestling with these issues for a long time. I've written uh, numerous books that reveal my findings based on the New Testament, my study of the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation. And so I'm just going to share my thoughts with you, uh, and I hope that you will grab a Bible and that you'll follow along with me, and we will take a look at some of these issues and, and just try to unravel the controversy and find out uh, very carefully what does the New Testament, and eventually what does the book of Revelation have to say about Israel and Bible prophecy. Uh, the first text that I'd like us to zero in on is in the New Testament, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Let me get my glasses here and make sure that I'm quoting it correctly. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Paul is, is writing and he's, he's, he's laying a foundation. He's dealing with a principle that is extremely important. Paul wrote that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned." Now, in this text, Paul is talking about two groups of people. The, the natural man, which basically represents a large uh, portion of humanity, 
humanity, uh, uh, the predominant portion of people, that they're just natural and they don't understand the things of the Spirit of God, things that come from the Holy Spirit. And that's just you know, typical to the way people are generally these days. Uh, in the next verse, verse 15, Paul said, but he that is spiritual understands all things. So you've got a natural man who sees through natural eyes, and then you've got the spiritual man who sees through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I want to develop this thought as we, as we go along. Now, if you have a Bible, follow me in the book of John. John is an amazing book. It's the fourth uh, gospel book. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John certainly was Jewish, and in the book of John, we find a conflict, uh, as in the other Gospels, between Jesus Christ and, and many of the Jewish leaders, not all of them, but many of them, and there's some amazing principles that are brought out in the book of John concerning the issue of the natural man and the spiritual man. So I'd like to look up uh, four texts with you. John chapter 2 is the first section in verses 18 to 21, we find Jesus having a dialogue with uh, certain Jewish leaders. And he told them in verse 19 that if he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. That's what he said, destroy this temple, Jesus told them. In verse 20, then said the Jews, 40 and six years it took to build this temple, and will you destroy it? Uh, and then rebuild it in three days. And then verse 21 says, but Jesus spoke of the temple of his body. Now in this particular instance, Jesus used the word temple. Uh, when he said, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days, he used it in reference to himself. The Jewish people that were listening to him, they were natural men. They didn't understand spiritual things. And when they heard what Jesus said, they immediately thought about the physical temple and they thought, how is this possible that this man can, uh, can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? So they were natural man, men who only, stood, who, who only understood and saw through natural eyes. But Jesus, of course, is the ultimate spiritual man and he was talking about a spiritual temple, the temple of his body. So that's uh, example number one. That's in John 2. In John 3, Jesus talked to a Jewish man named Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus came to him at night and he wanted to ask him some questions. And Jesus' response in verse 3, Jesus said to, to this Jewish man, he said, Nicodemus, you have to be born again. You're never going to understand anything that I have to say unless you are born again. Now, Nicodemus at this point was a natural man. And in verse 4, he responded and said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus, as a natural man, heard the sayings of Christ and thought that when he said, you must be born again, he was talking about physical birth. Uh, natural people tend to see things only literally on the surface and they don't see the underlying spiritual meaning. And so Nicodemus said, how can I go back into my mother's body and be born again? But that's not what Jesus was talking about. In verses 5 and 6, uh, Jesus clarified. In verse 6, he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. So when Jesus talked about a new birth, he was talking about a spiritual birth through the Holy Spirit. And then Nicodemus, if that happened to him, he would be able to see through spiritual eyes. So that's example number two. Uh, example number three is in the next chapter, in John chapter four, where Jesus had a dialogue with a Samaritan woman at a well. And Jesus told this woman that if she knew the gift of God and who he was, she would have asked him and he would have given her living water. Jesus said, I want to give you living water. And in verse 11, John 4, 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. Where are you going to get this living water? Now, this woman was a natural woman. She didn't understand. When Jesus said, I want to give you living water, she looked down and she said, the, the, How are you going to get down there, and where are you going to get this living water? And so she just saw on the surface of things, but uh, Jesus didn't mean real water. He meant the water of life through the Holy Spirit that he would give her if she believed in him as the Messiah. 
So that's the third example. Uh, in John chapter 6, we find Jesus having a dialogue with a group of Jewish people, and he told them in verse 54 that they needed to eat his flesh and drink his blood, or they would have no life in them. In verse 52, John 6, 52 says, The Jews therefore strove among themselves and said, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now these Jews were natural Jews. They only saw on the surface of things. They took Christ's words literally, uh, and they didn't see the spiritual meaning. So when Jesus said, You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, they thought he was talking about cannibalism. Uh, they thought he was talking about, you know, putting a little salt on his arm and saying, Here, take a bite. Uh, and they thought, you know, this is impossible. H how can we do this? Is this man teaching cannibalism? But Jesus was not teaching cannibalism. Uh, in verse 63, he said, the words that I s say to you, they are spirit and they are life. And when Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, he means take his word into your, into your life. So uh, in John 2, we find a group of Jewish people misunderstanding what Jesus meant about the temple. It wasn't a literal temple in that verse, it was the temple of his body. In John 3, Jesus talked about the new birth, and Nicodemus thought it was a literal birth, but no, it was a spiritual birth, being born again by the Holy Spirit. In John 4, you have a woman who uh, understood Christ's words about living water to mean water in the well, but it was spiritual water of the Holy Spirit. And in John 6, you have a group of Jewish people who understood Christ's words about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, is applying to cannibalism, but it was actually uh, his word that he wanted them to eat. Will Christians soon disappear, raptured before seven years of tribulation, when the Antichrist makes war against the Jews? Jesus Christ gave this special warning about the last days. Take heed that no one deceives you, Matthew 24, 4. Find out the truth about these end-time prophecies by ordering Steve's popular book, End Time Delusions, for only $13.95. To order, call 1-800-78-BIBLE or write to Whitehorse Media, P.O. Box 1139, Newport, Washington, 99156. There's four examples in the book of John where natural people understood Jesus Christ's words uh, in a surface, literal sense, but Jesus did not mean that. He was using these words in a deeply spiritual sense, and they didn't understand what he was saying. Now, this is very important. I've been studying this for years, so uh, at least hear me out. Those four examples in John chapter, in John 2, 3, 4, and 6 uh, have lessons for us in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. The book of Revelation is the greatest book on prophecy ever written. The book of Revelation contains prophecies about something called Mystery Babylon that deceives the whole world. It also talks about Israel and the tribes of Israel in Revelation chapter 7 who are sealed in their foreheads. And it also talks about a battle, a final battle in Revelation 16, 16 called Armageddon. And it's obvious that the contestants in Revelation are Babylon and Israel, and we have an Armageddon. And we also have uh, prophecies about a beast with seven heads and ten horns, and about a woman who rides a beast that has seven, tens, seven heads and ten horns. So here's the question. Is it possible, well, first of all, let me ask, who wrote the book of Revelation? Now, it says in chapter 1 that Revelation is, in verse 1, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So obviously, the book of Revelation came from Jesus. But who wrote it? Who was the physical writer? The answer to that is found in verse 4. It says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace. John wrote the book of Revelation. And John is the same one that wrote the book of John. In the book of John, we find Jesus Christ dialoguing with various people who only understood his words in a physical sense and who, who really missed what he was really trying to say. That's in the book of John. The same John wrote the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And the book of Revelation talks about things like the temple, it talks about Babylon, it talks about Israel, it talks about the beast, it talks about Armageddon. So the question is, does the same issue that we looked at in the book of John apply to the book of Revelation? In other words, uh, is there a natural way that we could read Revelation and, and, and see it simply, literally on the surface uh, and really miss what Revelation is really all about? And then is there a spiritual way through the Holy Spirit to understand the meaning of the book? Now, I'm not talking about being a liberal because I'm not a liberal and I'm not talking about rationalizing away or um, watering down what the prophecy is really saying. What I'm saying is how do we understand what the prophecy is really saying? What is it really saying? Is there going to be a literal seven-headed, ten-horned beast that looks like a lion, a leopard, uh, and a dragon as described in Revelation chapter 13? Or does that term apply to something else? Is there going to be a literal woman named uh, Babylon, Mystery Babylon, that rises up uh, out of the Mediterranean and, and goes around the world riding a seven-headed, ten-horned beast, that, uh, and that this is covered in the major news networks by CNN and Fox News? Uh, and when it talks about Israel being the center of the storm and the Battle of Armageddon and Babylon and Israel and Armageddon, uh, are these events that apply to those literal places, literal Babylon, literal Euphrates, literal Israel, a literal woman, a literal beast, or uh, do we need to understand Revelation through the eyes of the Holy Spirit? Uh, it's interesting in the book of Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, John starts out by saying, I was in the Spirit, and then he got the book. Uh, all throughout this book, John makes statements like that. In, in Revelation chapter uh, 17, when he talks about Mystery Babylon and this, uh, this lady, it says in verse 3 that he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman. So it's, obviously, it's obvious when you read the text that John was in the spirit when he got the book and he revealed these things through... Uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ gave him the book of Revelation and it's obvious that we need spiritual understanding just like the Jews needed spiritual understanding in the book of John, we need spiritual understanding in order to understand this book correctly. We need the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can't afford to be natural people. Like Paul said, the natural man doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. Now, let me put another... Um, thought into your head. When you study the New Testament carefully, it's also clear that just like there's a natural man and a spiritual man, so there are really two Israels in the New Testament. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18, Paul talked about, he said, Behold, Israel after the flesh. There is an Israel after the flesh uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, 18. When you go to the book of Romans, especially chapters 9 to 11 that really deal with these Israel issues. Uh, in verse 3, Romans 9, 3, Paul wrote, I wish that I were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh who are Israelites. So Paul loved the Jewish people so much and he knew that many of them were rejecting him, rejecting, rejecting Jesus, and he even wished that he could be um, separated from Christ if they could be saved. He was so uh, sacrificial in his love. And in verse 4, again, he talked about Israelites according to the flesh. So there are Israelites according to the flesh. Now, in verse 6, Paul drops a bomb. And in verse 6, he says, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. They are not all the Israel of God who are of Israel of the literal Jewish nation. So he really says that there's two Israels, just like I've got two eyes and two ears, two hands. Paul said in verse 6, there's two Israels, and he said they're not all Israel, meaning God's Israel, who are of Israel. Verse 7 says, neither just because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac your seed will be called. Now in verse 8, Paul wrote, that is, they which are, they which are the children of the flesh, those which are just 
children of the flesh, natural descendants of Abraham. He said, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise. They are counted for the seed, counted as the seed of Abraham, the children of the promise. Now, who are the children of the promise that are counted by God as the, as the seed of Abraham? The answer to that is in the book of Galatians. And I've done an extensive study on Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 14, Paul makes it clear who he's talking about. I'm in Ephesians, wrong text. Need my glasses. Galatians 3, verse 14. Paul said that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So in Romans 9, verse 8, he said the children of the promise are counted as the seed. And in Galatians 3, 14, he talks about the Gentiles and the Jews together who believe in Jesus Christ, who receive the promise. There's the promise. The children of the promise are counted as the seed. And we receive the promise of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, through faith. So Gentiles can be part of that promise through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, in, in Galatians 3.29, Paul drops another bomb. And he wrote, if you, and Paul's writing to Gentiles, and I'm assuming that most of you who are uh, watching or listening to this program are Gentiles, Paul wrote in verse 29, Galatians 3.29, that if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, and you are an heir according to the promise. You are an heir of the promises of God that were given to Israel, to the seed of Abraham. Paul says that you can be an heir to those promises, and you can be part of the seed of Abraham through Jesus Christ. So Paul's clear in Galatians that Jews who believe in Jesus and Gentiles who believe in Jesus are all counted as the seed. They're all part of the seed of Abraham. Now, in chapter 6, at the end of the book, Paul wrote, in Christ Jesus, verse 15, circumcision doesn't avail anything, and that applies to the Jews, nor uncircumcision, that applies to the Gentiles. But what really counts is a new, a new creature. And verse 16 says, as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. The Israel of God. So in 1 Corinthians 10, 18, Paul said, there's an Israel of the flesh. And in Galatians 6, 16, he said, there's an Israel of God. In other words, there's a natural Israel and there's a spiritual Israel. And the Israel of God is an Israel that is composed of Jews who believe in Jesus. Like Matthew, Mark, not Luke, because Luke was a Gentile, but John and uh, all the disciples, uh, Peter, James, etc., who accepted Christ as the Messiah. And then Gentiles, like you and people around the world, who believe in Jesus, trust the promise, they are also counted as the seed. So when you study uh, Galatians very carefully, the Israel of God in Galatians is composed of Jews and Gentiles together who believe in the Lord and who have the Holy Spirit that has changed their lives and they become children of the promise of the Holy, of the Holy Ghost. That's what we read in the book of Galatians. Now, I'll just give you a little background about myself. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Jewish. Steve Wahlberg, it's a Jewish name. Uh, my family's Jewish. I grew up in the Hollywood Hills of Southern California. I was born in 1959, but my family was, uh, sad to say, very secular. Um, we didn't go to the synagogue. We didn't read the Bible. We didn't pray. Uh, even bar mitzvah wasn't urged upon us. Uh, as a, a teenager, and I was Jewish, but as a Jewish teenager, I just, I followed the flesh. I was of the flesh. I got involved in the Hollywood scene, the lifestyle, the, the drugs, the entertainment, the rock and roll, uh, the cocaine, the LSD, the marijuana. It's not a pretty picture. and That's all behind me now. But I was Jewish, but I was Jewish. I was part of Israel according to the flesh. That's just the way I lived, a fleshy way. I was certainly a natural man. When I was 20 years old, by the grace of God, 
through the goodness of my Lord and my Messiah, uh, I began to read the Bible. I read the New Testament. I discovered the Garden of Gethsemane. I discovered Jesus Christ as my Messiah and as my Savior. And I was so moved by Jesus' suffering for me in, in Gethsemane, and the Holy Spirit made a move on me as a 20-year-old lost Jewish person in, in, in L.A., in Hollywood. And uh, I finally saw the light. I saw Christ's goodness. I saw his grace. I saw that he was my Messiah, and I accepted him as my Savior. And I can testify uh, without any uh, question in my mind that when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, the Holy Spirit came into my life, and I was born again. I was changed, and I began to see everything differently through new eyes. Prior to age 20, I was uh, part of Israel according to the flesh. When I accepted Jesus as my Messiah, I became part of the Israel of God through the Holy Spirit who had changed my life. And that's the truth. Now, in the next few programs, as we continue on uh, with this series, eventually we're going to go deeper into the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation talks about a final battle between Babylon and God and Israel and the beast and the false prophet and the, and the harlot. Now, the question is, uh, yes, Israel is in Revelation. Yes, Israel will be part of Bible prophecy. But here's the question. The question is, which Israel is the center of the end? Will it be Israel of the flesh, just natural Jewish people centered in the Middle East or wherever they may be? Or is it the Israel of God in Jesus Christ that is composed of Jewish people and non-Jews together who have the Holy Spirit and who believe in the Lord? Uh, I will prove to you when we get there in the days ahead that the book of Revelation's focus, its center, is definitely Jesus Christ and the Israel of God that is centered in him. So uh, stay tuned. More to come. God bless you, and we we'll hope to see you then. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wolberg, and we want you to know that Whitehorse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible, designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about Whitehorse Media, or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg.